you you predicted that this was all going to happen in Ukraine. Um, how have things kind of matched up to your initial thoughts of when this was all initially unfolding to what we now see today in Ukraine? Well, I'd say a couple of things. First of all, that <clears throat> the Russian progress uh, turned out to be different from what I anticipated. I thought that they would go in on three or four operational axes and cut deeply into Ukraine. Uh, instead, uh, and, and of course, I did not have a copy of the operations order, so I didn't know what the instructions to Russian commanders were. But the Russian commanders were instructed to minimize casualties uh, on the Ukrainian side. Mm -hmm. In other words, they knew they were going into eastern Ukraine, where most of the population is effectively Russian. But they also didn't want to do any unnecessary uh, collateral damage. They wanted to avoid unnecessary collateral damage as much as possible. So... Instead, they advanced on a front of almost 500 kilometers in these battalion tactical groups, which is a, an interesting and a good organization for combat. I think it's proven itself in many ways. But this spread them very thinly. And I think the underlying assumption was that many of the Russians there would rapidly come over to them, which would ease their progress through Ukraine. But then the Russians themselves discovered, this is, these are the Russian commanders, that uh, they had made a terrible mistake in Moscow in, in one area. They had told the Russians in eastern Ukraine, well, we're coming in. We're going to destroy Ukrainian forces, effectively denazify it, as I think you, your listeners have heard. And uh, then we're going to leave. And we're not going to stay permanently. We're, we're simply interested in the autonomy or independence of the two uh, breakaway republics in the east and legitimizing Crimea. Well, the Russian population said, that's fine, then don't expect any help from us, because if you're not going to stay here permanently and liberate us from the Ukrainians, then when you leave, the Ukrainian secret police will roll in and kill all of us and our families. Well, that had a big impact in Moscow. People finally began recognizing that this was about much more than just destroying the Ukrainian army. That was essential. And that has taken time largely because the Ukrainians decided to move into cities and urban areas and to prepare defenses and to sit, sit down and, and wait for the Russians to arrive. The Ukrainians have never launched an operational uh, counteroffensive. There have been minor counterattacks here or there on a battalion level, but nothing organized across the front. So the Russians then changed their modus operandi. And they recognized that if these Ukrainian forces were going to immobilize them in defensive positions in cities or elsewhere, well, that's when you bring in your strike forces, your artillery, rocket artillery, conventional artillery, tactical ballistic missiles, and you pulverize them out of existence. That's what they've done. And the Ukrainians uh, have not managed to organize any serious counterattack. They talked about a million-man counteroffensive recently, which, of course, never materialized. And I, no one knows what the exact casualty figures are, but I can tell you the ones that are being floated in the West about the Russians are grossly exaggerated. Uh, the Russians have lost somewhere between 11 and 12,000 killed and another 15, 20,000 wounded. But the Ukrainians are looking at upwards of 60,000 dead. And how many thousands more beyond that uh, were wounded is anybody's guess. Many people have died of wounds because of inadequate medical care and medical infrastructure. So the Ukrainian army is decimated. The Ukrainians have lost this war. The initiative has passed very early permanently to the Russians. The Russians have pulled most of their regular forces back. That's their regular army. They've rested and refitted them. And I expect a major offensive this month to finish off uh, the fight to Odessa and then probably Kharkov. I'd be very surprised if that didn't happen. And the, the fight has been carried on largely by the Donetsk militia, these are the forces out of the two breakaway republics. They fought very effectively, by the way, and they've taken heavy casualties on occasion. But they're not the regular Russian army. They have been given uh, equipment. They've got a lot of tanks that they've been given for use as assault guns. After the artillery pulverizes the concrete fortifications, the assault guns are brought up and at point-blank range, they're annihilating whatever is left. Uh, that's, that is essentially tactically what's been going on. He's also had mercenaries. The, the Wagner organization has been part of that. And uh, he's had the Chechens who fought very, very well, uh, much better than I had anticipated, very well led as well. So 
everything is in in Russia's favor at this point. The sanctions have blown back badly on the West. The Russian economy, contrary to some of the reports that you've heard, is not suffering badly. On the contrary, it's selling more oil, gas, minerals, resources, food to other customers around the world than they ever have before. So the real question is, how much longer do the Russians wait before they launch this offensive? And then probably they'll declare uh, these areas of eastern Ukraine to be Russian. And whether they uh, deem them to be a new independent Russian Ukraine or it is simply assimilated with the rest of the Russian state, I don't know. But I think that's what will happen. And we show no signs of being willing to talk to them. We keep mm -hmm. urging the Ukrainians to, to fight. The Ukrainians keep losing uh, equipment and people. We keep pouring equipment into them. But I'm beginning to think that's turned into a, a terrible scam because most of our money that was destined to provide equipment for the Ukrainians just goes to the Department of Defense. We ship equipment over there. Then the money is transferred from the Department of Defense to the defense industries. And uh, the usual suspects on the Hill are rewarded with their donations and campaign supporters. So I, I'm beginning to wonder if anybody's really looking at that. Now, I know that the Defense Department said they were going to send people to Ukraine to try and track where all the equipment and money goes. Good luck. We know that uh, the bazaars in uh, Kosovo are full of uh, American equipment for sale and European equipment. Uh, we've had reports from Iraq that the Kurds have been armed with equipment that came out of Ukraine. Uh, this, of course, was Erdogan's objection to the Swedish and Finnish membership bid. I don't think we've seen the end of it, and I wouldn't be surprised uh, where this stuff ends up, and probably, for the most part, in the wrong hands. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, what's Ukraine? It becomes some sort of rump state? Uh, I don't know. But it's a tragedy that could have been averted. All we had to do was listen to what Putin and the Russians were saying since 2008, what they would and would not tolerate. And if we'd done that and sat down and talked with them as mature adults, we could have come up with some sort of compromise. We did the opposite. We stonewalled with the goal of, quote unquote, punishing Russia, which is absurd nonsense. And uh, we've ruined Eastern Europe. And I, I don't think this thing called NATO and now increasingly the EU is really going to hold together much longer and be terribly meaningful. And I don't think that was what uh, Biden and his friends wanted or the people on the Hill. But truthfully, we look impotent. Uh, and clearly, we don't have the force sitting in Eastern Europe to intervene in Ukraine and and seriously challenge the Russians' control of eastern Ukraine. Based on what you've seen from the Biden administration and the State Department over the past several months, um, are you worried about the, the future of the United States and the collective West? I mean, like you, you have just yesterday uh, Zelensky at the behest likely of, of, you know, Pelosi and the State Department come out and demand that China have direct talks with Ukraine to get, you know, to, to basically condemn Russia and bring the Russian military operation to an end. Like, how delusional are these people? What what do you make of this? And and how much of this is integral to the, si the system, meaning, um, as some put it, like within the deep state? It doesn't really matter if it's a Republican or Democrat president, it's just kind of going to be there no matter what. <clears throat> With very few exceptions, and there are some good exceptions on the Hill, uh, several in the House and a few in the Senate. I don't think the people we're dealing with are truly serious. And by this, I mean, <clears throat> they don't seem to understand that we don't live in 1990. After all, you're talking about people that presided over a, mon a money printing exercise that amounts in real terms to about four times the amount of money that we have printed in our entire history as a nation. Uh, that particular horse has left the barn. Nobody seems to care. And I think by the spring of next year, uh, we'll see. But inflation will probably reach 10, 12, 15 percent. And at that point, I guess the game is over. And then we'll find out the, the consequence with this sort of Weimar approach to economics. But I, I just don't see that the people in charge understand the gravity of their actions. You know, <clears throat> this thing with Mrs. Pelosi is, is almost comedic, if you stop and think about it. And, and what we don't appreciate is the impact on the Chinese or the Russians. We, we never, never bothered to listen to the Russians. 
and they were quite serious about their concerns with the potential to put forces in eastern Ukraine that would threaten Russia. And indeed, we were doing everything in our power to support that. We haven't listened carefully to the Chinese. You know, for instance, Xi, who is now being vilified as some sort of Hitlerian figure, had identified the year 2049 as the probable date for peaceful reunification of Taiwan and China. Now, why would we be upset over that? Why would that concern us in any way? Everyone in Asia has recognized Beijing as the legitimate leader of the Chinese nation. Most people in Asia view what's happening right now between Taiwan and China as an internal Chinese affair, and they're trying to figure out why we want to intervene in it and turn it into a regional war, as we've almost turned Ukraine into a regional war. <clears throat> a friend of mine was talking to me earlier today, and he's got a lot of experience on the Hill, uh, worked in Congress uh, and in the Senate, and uh, <clears throat> he said, Doug, he said, what the people in Moscow and Beijing don't understand is that the majority of people in Washington are pimples on the backside of American history. They don't matter. But unfortunately, people in Moscow and, and Beijing have concluded that they do matter, that they're serious. And as a result, they're acting the way they do. I mean, the one thing that Nancy Pelosi did accomplish on her trip was to solidify the relationship between Moscow and Beijing. I would not be surprised if we did not hear a, a formal announcement and, and watched some sort of signing ceremony uh, bringing this alliance to fruition between the Russians and the Chinese, making it a real military alliance. The Russians have already said to uh, the Chinese that they will back China mm -hmm. in whatever it deems appropriate, whatever it wants to do. And we continue to sit there and act as though this is a joke, that this is unserious. That what do they think we are? Uh, I mean, set aside all the nonsense about moral supremacy, which we like to preach. Let's just look at the facts. We're not the world's sole superpower. We're not the same country we were in 1991. We have enormous problems, particularly with the economy, with in, in, you know internal societal cohesion, which is a polite way of saying we're divided along racial lines and economic lines. Why would you do these things? Why would you poke these two cobras and expect them to react any differently from the way they have. So I, I think my friend is right. I think these people will go down in history as having created conditions for destruction and anarchy in the international system, have further eroding our position, undermining our prestige and our credibility. And uh, hopefully that's it because the biggest mistake we could make is to suddenly sail most of the United States Navy over there and present the Chinese with a target array and make demands on them. Because at that point, the Chinese will act. And the Chinese are not like us. We are, we're, they are not like us. They think carefully. Mm -hmm. They consider all the options. For them, the use of force is the last resort. But once they decide to use it, they will go all the way to the end, if necessary, to be successful. In the meantime, they will do what they can to undermine us, and our position in Asia, there's no question about it. What else would you expect them to do? But we need to understand that they're now in a very different path, and they're not going to get off that path for some time, at least not until we demonstrate that we have a completely new government in the hands of responsible, educated, mature adults. Um, when it comes to China's response to Pelosi's visit and you, you have them introducing now Lin lease bill in the house for Taiwan and you have, uh, what else? The Menendez and, and Graham bill to basically gut the one China policy. You have all of this combined. We don't really know how China is going to respond, but we see a lot of things taking place right now. You, I mean, there's a list of things they've already done, uh, to respond, but let's say hypothetically, and, and I hope it doesn't, but hypothetically, if you do have some sort of a military altercation that takes place, a military reunification, uh, maybe a standoff between the U.S. and China. What do you think? What do you what do you have to say about um, China's military and their capabilities? Because with Russia, you know, we had seen their capabilities, uh, limited capabilities, I guess, in Syria, especially with, um, you know, their air power. What do you what do you think about China and their buildup and their defensive preparations for what they knew or know, I guess, is eventually probably going to arrive at their doorstep in one way or another? Well, for some time, 
<clears throat> I and many other observers had pointed out that Russia was a nation of roughly 140 million. Uh, they did not have a, an inexhaustible manpower pool to draw on. They were trying very hard under uh, Putin's leadership to sort of build a prosperity first and foremost. In other words, build up the economy, improve living standards. And so the budget of the entire Defense Department in Russia was roughly equivalent to the budget of the United States Army. And this budget was enough to provide for a few hundred thousand ready soldiers whose principal mission was to defend Russia, defend its frontiers. The expeditionary forces that went to Syria went in to help save Assad's regime from destruction, to keep the Turks out of Syria, and ultimately to contain the Iranians and convince them not to go further. Uh, the Russians seem to have been reasonably successful at relatively low cost, but you're right. At that point, uh, we have not seen evidence for some of the more exotic technologies that we have, although I would argue that that's changing. And we have never seen uh, the most capable technologies at their disposal in Ukraine. In fact, I would argue that they have tended to hold many of their best troops in reserve because they reckoned with the possibility that NATO might intervene. Mm -hmm. And if it intervened, they wanted to have a force that could rapidly respond and annihilate whatever crossed the border. Now, when you move to China, <clears throat> you have a, a very different country. Chinese and Russians are different. They don't think the same way at all. And China is about business. Chinese culture is about business. All If you look at their culture, the, the common sayings about military power and about soldiers are all very derogatory. Whereas China has never held professional military men in very high esteem. The exact opposite of, let us say, Japan. And the Chinese uh, do not maintain forces uh, that are as highly disciplined, highly trained and capable, I would argue, as either the imperial Japanese forces of the past or as capable and, and disciplined and well-led and well-trained and well-equipped as the Japanese are right now. They have been focused on defense. And if you look at their expenditures, they have expended enormous resources on tactical and theater ballistic missiles, effectively coastal defenses. And how do they defend? They defend on the basis of their experience with the Royal Navy, primarily in the 1800s, and then subsequently the Japanese, because they tended to focus on the rivers and move through these giant rivers into China's interior. China is not going to let those things happen again. So when you look at the distribution of their de defensive arsenal of missiles, which is huge on the, on the intermediate range and tactical uh, range, <clears throat> it's very clear that they're prepared certainly out to about 150 nautical miles to sink anything that shows up above the surface. The one area <coughs> where they are arguably weak, and most of the world is, frankly, we aren't as strong in the area as we should be, is in anti-submarine warfare. <clears throat> and they do fear the United States submarine fleet. Our submarines can operate in deep water, and uh, as long as you have the thermal climb, those nuclear subs can stay out there and be invisible and vulnerable, invincible for long periods of time. They do fear that because they don't want to have to go through a blockade, and hence fearing that at some point we might try to blockade them, which is what the Japanese and the British did, uh, they've pursued this one belt, one road approach strategically in Central Asia and across Eurasia. Now, they have an advantage that we don't. <coughs> We're primarily uh, a maritime and aerospace power, which means that we have great reach, but not much staying power at distance. They are a continental power with great depth. And behind them stands Russia. And Russia is not only friendly, but it has an abundance of food and resources. And this was the point I tried to make on Tucker's show that, you know, it's a ship's a fool to fight a fort. In other words, if a, sh a fleet pulled up and tried to slug it out with a large fortress that had big guns, the fleet inevitably lost. The fleet would have inevitably sail away when it ran out of ammunition. Well, that's kind of where we are because we don't have that many logistical hubs in Asia. Uh, the Chinese know where they are. They're targetable and they can easily be destroyed. So how long could we sustain an offensive from the sea against China? And I think that's, the answer is for a very limited period. And we can't land anything. If we tried to, they would all be annihilated because today you have persistent surveillance 
from above, space-based, terrestrial. And even if you remove the space-based surveillance capabilities, you, you have other redundant capabilities. You can use aerostats, unmanned systems that have the same packages on them that can operate as surrogate satellites. <clears throat> we have that. They have that. The Russians have it. So <clears throat> I guess the point is the idea of going to war with them is pretty stupid. Uh, it, it's not a it's not a, a big win for us. Could we sink uh, Chinese vessels? Of course we could. What difference is that going to make in the long run? Yeah, you're not going to go ashore in that country. I mean, we stopped the uh, the Korean War in 1953 <clears throat> after Eisenhower was president. He walked into a briefing, and Mark Clark was the new supreme commander. And Mark Clark had a plan to invade China. And his plan called for 850,000 troops in the 8th Army in Korea. And Eisenhower listened to this briefing, and he said, thank you. He got up, he walked out of the tent, talked to his military assistant, and said, good God, the American people aren't going to support an invasion of China. We don't want to invade China. We may not like China today, but the day will come when we'll want to do business with China. So we've got to put an end to this. Well, that's how you got the end of the Korean War. It didn't come immediately, but a few months later, we had the armistice. I don't think very many people in the United States would be happy if their fathers and grandfathers had been murdered in Manchuria in a pointless war trying to intervene in China. So the whole idea of a military confrontation with China is something that we should put on the shelf and forget. What we should be doing is recognizing that their interests in Taiwan, just as Russia's interests in Ukraine, are legitimate. And that's something that we refuse to do. Why? I don't know. Just as the Russians eventually concluded that our interests in Cuba were legitimate in 1963. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I want to ask about, because I've seen so many different opinions on this within the Republican Party and mainly like the MAGA wing of the Republican Party, is it kind of just what you summarize. We might not like China today, but you know we we do business with them and we're going to want to do more business with them as the world continues to change and BRICS expands and they develop new, you know, global reserve currency. Who knows what they're going to do, you know? Um but you hear so much of I I don't know if saber rattling is the right term for, it, but you hear you hear um so much commentary from leading Republicans, even within the MAGA, you know, uh, wing of the party that are going out and saying things like Taiwan is a country and we stand with, you know, Taiwan sovereignty and stuff like that. And, you know, making these comments that almost seem pretty much in line with the State Department and people like Blinken, for example. So um, speaking from your experience, what do you think the Republican Party, how, how they stand today? Um, and how they want to move forward with relations with China, uh, specifically the the MAGA wing of the party and, and Donald Trump, I'm sure you could maybe give some insight on as well. Well, <clears throat> based on my exposure to President Trump and my talks with him, President Trump is a man who understands that the use of force is the last resort. This is not someone who is interested in waging war. He is interested in maintaining a very strong and capable armed force, which he sees as vital to deterrence, to our national security, and to our credibility. But he's not uh, part of the jingoist uh, Republican wing. There are a couple of things operating here. On one level, I run into people all the time say, well, those Chinese, look what happened to our manufacturing base. Well, we got to get back at China for that. And look at the Chinese and fentanyl pouring into our country. Well, let me point out a couple of things. First of all, Americans sitting on the hill and in corporate America sold our manufacturing base to China. Chinese didn't come over here and steal it in the middle of the night. In fact, in many cases, the Chinese didn't come over here looking for it. But when it became obvious that we have a ruling corporate elite, a class of billionaires and billionaires that are only too ready to sell us out in terms of jobs and, and industries, they took advantage of it. Secondly, the fentanyl that's coming into this country is coming up through Mexico. Now, a lot of people can tell you that they've seen all sorts of things offloaded in San Diego and San Francisco, put on trains and shipped down to Mexico. Those are the ingredients to a whole range of deadly drugs that are cooked up down there. The cartels take these things, repackage them, mix them and send them north. 
Now, if we would like that to stop, then close the border, put forces on the border. You know, for over a hundred years, every cavalry regiment in the United States Army served on the border. Eisenhower, Patton, MacArthur, everyone served on the Mexican border. Mexico was always viewed as a potential second front in any war that we fought because every Mexican government was predisposed to be anti-American. That doesn't mean we hate Mexicans or that Mexicans hate us. These are just facts. And during the Cold War, the largest KGB operation in the Western Hemisphere was in Mexico City, and everybody knew it. So the, the, the point is, you've got to get control of your own borders, and you have to restore the, the rule of law inside the country. So don't blame China for the things we don't like about our country. Blame Americans. Blame the people on the Hill. Where were they? Where were all of these courageous senators who now talk about confronting Chinese military power when it was critical to save our manufacturing base, to save millions of jobs, to save our economy, to protect our borders, to stop illegal immigration and human trafficking? Where were they? Well, they were silent. I don't hear much out of them right now, frankly. And I think, again, whenever you listen to people from the Hill, and this is a tragic comment, but it's true. You've got to go back and, and look at the money flow. Where does the money come from that keeps them in office? And that explains an awful lot of what they say. Mm -hmm. You know, who's the donor? Who are the donors? And once you, once you figure it out, if it's George Soros or it's defense industries or it's the oil industry or something else, then you begin to make sense out of what you're hearing. But I think most Americans are coming around to the understanding that Republicans or Democrats we really aren't represented in Washington. Yeah, I 100 percent agree with that. I mean, that's why we have the mess we have today. You talked about the inflationary crisis that we're currently going through and it's going to get worse um, and all the other economic you know, woes that we're facing in the United States right now. Uh, do you think that the economic crisis that is all but certain to hit your I mean, it's already there, but it's going to get far worse and you have the energy crisis on top of that just absolutely staggering levels of, uh, of of destruction i think we're going to see all across europe as winter approaches do you think that could potentially bring an end to the um support for the ukraine you know uh, defenses in uh russia against the special military operation it might eventually bring about some negotiations <clears throat> I, I'm hesitant to say yes. I, I think so. I think of particularly in Germany, the German population is not very pleased with the current chancellor and his government. Germans are beginning to figure out that Merkel was hardly their friend and that many of the uh, chickens, so to say, that she uh, established have now come home to roost in ugly ways. You, you have several hundred thousand Ukrainians on top of two million Muslims and these are, these are groups of people that are not very cohabitable, let us say. In other words, Ukrainian refugees are having problems with the Muslims, the Muslims are having problems with them, on top of the rise in criminality and problems in Germany. At some point, the Germans are going to vote in a new government. And Germans are different from Frenchmen or Italians. The French and the Italians will go into the streets and there will be a revolution. Germans don't tend to do that. Germans say, no, let's go to the polls and vote in a different bunch. So eventually, I think you'll get a group in Germany that will take an interest in Germany and come to some sort of arrangement with Moscow. Uh, this whole business of German dependence on Moscow for fuel uh, and, and heat and so forth, I, I think people always assume that any deal you, you make with Russia is a deal with some terrible devil. Again, you've got to look at Russia. What is Russia's needs? The Russians desperately need to do business with Europe. Uh, they want to do business with Europe. The Russians want to be, frankly, viewed as part of Europe. We've made it impossible for them to do that. The Germans have unfortunately followed our lead. I think that will be reversed. And then we'll find that we are probably no longer wanted in Europe. I think we're going to have similar problems in Asia because I think the Asians are going to view us as unnecessarily destabilizing. You know, we, we were once seen as this force for stability and reason. You know, as I said before to many, many times, if you go back over the last 50 years, I can't imagine any American president, certainly up through George Bush, 
who would not have immediately intervened to stop crises from breaking out involving Russia and Eastern Europe. Uh, we have had the opposite now, a very uh, irresponsible, reckless group of people who've decided that they can play. So I, that's why I said I think these people are play acting. They don't understand the strategic consequences. And that's true in Asia and it's true here. Now, can we recover? Obviously. But nothing is going to change for the better until we clean out most of what passes for a government in Washington. I, I must be frank. Mm -hmm. Speaking of uh, consequences, what do you do? You have any thoughts on the recent Senate votes to approve the expansion of NATO to Finland and Sweden? Rand Paul and Josh Hawley were the only two in the Senate that voted against this effort. Um, but what do you think? I'm curious, because obviously I, I, I'm sure you believe in the idea that we should have you know, strong military allies. But uh, how do you weigh that with just outright provocation against countries like Russia? I mean, you're more than doubling the amount of land that they share now with the NATO state. Well, first of all, uh, let, let's keep something in mind. Uh, the Finns are not afraid of a Russian invasion. Uh, and they, they are well organized, well equipped, and quite prepared to deal with it if it should ever happen again. But they've actually done good business with the Russians. In fact, the president of Finland said, I'm not joining NATO because I fear Russia. I'm joining NATO because you, Mr. Putin, invaded another sovereign country. Okay, I think he's making a mistake and that's a dumb idea, but that was his position. The Swedes have a long and troubled history with Russia. That goes back to 1709 at Poltava and the defeat of Charles XII, uh, through his own foolishness, by the way, by uh, Peter the Great. Uh, so I, I'm not surprised at the Swedish attitude. But the problem for us is that we really don't have real military allies on the ground in Europe. What we have are dependencies, military colonies. These places all expect us to defend them. That's why everybody wants to join. Join NATO. Uh, America will defend you. And then, by the way, it's another uh, source of uh, or opportunity for interaction with the U.S. government. There's money in it. Another avenue of approach for us. There are benefits to us from, from being in this organization. And they're right. I just don't see very many benefits to us. And uh, I think that was uh, Donald Trump's view, that we were spending all this money, but these people were not doing what was required to defend themselves. And Europeans have to do that. And uh, this just sort of postpones it. Mm -hmm. the, the Swedes are quite happy to become a dependency, and so are the Finns, unfortunately. I think it's a mistake. But that's neither here nor there. Now, Asia is much more serious in my judgment because the Chinese, who are very serious people, are, are genuinely offended and at the same time threatened by our behavior vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. The Russians are not afraid of us. They know us, unfortunately, for what we are. I think, I think Putin has a healthy respect for us if we know what we're doing, but he knows we don't know what we're doing. The Chinese... They don't understand that. They think Pelosi is the member of a government that is about to pass this Menendez-Graham bill uh, that reverses Taiwan's status and makes us, uh, once again, Taiwan's a lie. And uh, this is a very dangerous thing because it's not necessary. The Chinese have no plans to invade Taiwan. Now they may feel that they have to. And remember, the Chinese are not interested in destroying the industry that exists on Taiwan. They're also not interested in putting their industries at risk either. So there's this whole picture of China in the United States. I think it's just fundamentally false, mm -hmm. really false. I'm not saying that, you know, we should all grip hands and sing Kumbaya. What I'm simply saying is we need to do business on the basis of identified interests. And if you respect those interests, you can avoid conflict. And as I said, Xi had talked about 2049 as a target date for reunification. Now I suspect he's telling the general staff of the PLI to plan on something next year, potentially. Because that's how that's how offended and that's how concerned they are with the Pelosi nonsense and Biden's utterly ridiculous statement that, yes, we're committed to defending Taiwan. We haven't been committed to that since 1979, and we've had no problems. Yeah, I was talking to someone yesterday about that, and uh, they were brought they brought up the 2049 reunification point to me. 
And I was just like, I, I don't, I don't think they're gonna wait that long now. I mean, you have all these threats. I mean, you, the Lend Lease part is one, I think, one of the craziest parts of all. I mean, obviously, we've been training Taiwanese separatists for some time, uh, but, but the, I mean, just the fact that you're gonna pass that, and then the gutting of the One China policy is, is insane. Well, keep something else in mind, Jackson. There, there are two major parties on that island. One is the old KMT, that was Chiang Kai Shek's party. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> that's about 48%. And right now, 51, 52% is with the, the Democratic Progressive People's Party, which is the pro-Japanese slash pro-Western party. The KMT has favored reunification with China for some time now. If they were to win a future election, we could wake up and discover that they have voted themselves into China. Because what Taiwan wants to become, and ultimately what mainland China would like to become is some facsimile of Singapore. Singapore is the model. And what, does, what is Singapore? Anybody who spent any time there says, oh, well, I think it's a fascist state. <laughs> you think? Yeah, but the Chinese are interested in what? They want to be safe. They want to be able to make money. They want to improve their living. They want to pursue their individual interests. And Singapore allows that. Lee Q. Wan delivered so both sides, Taiwan and China, that really is what they would like to have. And in fact, it's not very different from the attitude in Japan. And again, as I try to tell people, if you want to know what, what's the probability of you being convicted in a court of a serious crime in China, it's 99%. If you want to know what the probability of being convicted in a court of law of a serious crime in Japan is, it's 99%. If you want to know what the probability of being convicted of a serious crime is in a court in Vietnam, it's 99%. Of course, in North Korea, it's 100%. We know that. But the point I try to make to people is that you step back and understand this is a different world from ours. Mm -hmm. Different culture, different way of thinking. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It also doesn't mean that we're necessarily right, but they're different. And I'm so tired of people in Washington condemning everyone left and right for not adequately tending to whatever we think is appropriate in their country. You know, we used to take the position, Republicans used to take the position, that what countries do, what governments do in their own countries is their affair. And if we didn't like something, we would discuss it, but we would do so privately. That's been thrown overboard since the Second World War as we've run around and proselytized and pushed our ideas. And I ask everyone to look back on the last 50, 60, 70 years and tell me how well has that worked? Yeah. Yeah. If you're if you're if the Chinese aren't allowing hormone blockers for their four year old kids, then it's time to start World War Three. Oh, by the way, that's a, <laughs> a good thing that you brought that up, because the KMT party in Taiwan was violently opposed to same sex marriage. Every nation, Asian nation is opposed to same sex marriage. The, the, the PRC, People's Republic of China, is opposed to same-sex marriage. That was passed by the current government of Taiwan, largely to curry favor with us. Uh, and that is not popular, and I expect that that will be reversed in the future. And again, uh, whatever we want to do is fine, but it's time to respect the will and wishes of others in the societies they live in. I, it seems easy to me, but it seems to be difficult. We only have a few more minutes, so I want to ask you one more question. Uh, what advice do you have to give to, you know, the younger generation, people like my age, people who are growing up right now, people who've only really heard one narrative about countries like Russia and China and the global powers that are, you know, quickly taking shape in this multipolar world? Uh, what do you have to say about young people who... Um, maybe even want to pursue uh, leadership positions. How, how, how should they see the world? How should we pursue diplomatic relations uh, moving forward? Because I think it's very scary what these elite Ivy League institutions are teaching students across America right now. Well, I can only speak from my own experience and probably the single most important, important event in, in my life from the vantage point of education was that I spent a year as an exchange student at the age of 16 in Germany. And uh, quite frankly, I only knew what I knew from books 
the few books that I had read, you know, at 16, you're not exactly a towering intellect unless you're some genius, and I certainly wasn't. Uh, and living in that country for a year, particularly in northern Germany, was enormously enlightening because I suddenly began to see that the Germans were different from what I had anticipated and thought, but I also began to see us differently, see my own country through a different lens. I began to understand why, in many cases, people overseas are bewildered by us, don't understand why we do the things we do. I can tell you that nobody in Europe, and you would think the Europeans would probably be the best to judge it, really understand how we are governed. We, they just don't. And that's why you have this problem with Pelosi, who uh, obviously is not in the foreign policy wing of the United States government, going in and making this grandiose splash, uh, on, as Newt Gingrich once did back in 97. But it's it's usually not productive and it usually has maybe some benefit to them at home but otherwise no so i would say to anybody who can if you can go overseas for any length of time and live somewhere and try to understand others and see the world through a different lens that's enormously important uh, and as far as uh, leading people you know i'm somebody that thinks that either you can or you can't uh, I wish I could tell everybody what the U.S. Army likes to preach, which is that we'll send you over here, we'll give you all these books and this checklist, we'll send you to these courses, and you'll come out a leader. Ugh, that's crap. <laughs> uh, you know, my experience is that uh, there are very few real leaders, and that's a big problem at the service academies. We tended to graduate a lot of people who couldn't lead a troop of Boy Scouts across the street, but they were very bright academically or they played well in a sport or something, and they managed to, to get through. But they were never leaders, and they certainly weren't much as professional soldiers. It's very rare that you see a MacArthur or a Lee. Uh, they just don't come along very much in history. So I think you, you either, you've either got it or you don't. And the only way to find that out is to give it a shot and see how you turn out in whatever field you choose. And then, of course, Churchill's right. Don't... Uh, don't like what you do, do what you like. Got an awful lot of people I know that are a lot wealthier than I am, and they're miserable because mm -hmm. they became bankers, investment bankers, and so forth. Their health is terrible. Their lives are destroyed. They're on their third divorce or something. So you've got to make a decision about your life. What do you want out of it? And I don't think you can contribute much to society if you personally are miserable. 